Hey everybody, thank you for taking the time out of your day to stop by. This week we're discussing another viewer suggestion from CH. I didn't catch your name, just your screen name, so I'm sorry in advance. But they asked me to talk about the unsolved murder of Jennifer Odom. Jennifer's case is almost 30 years old and authorities are still unsure of who did this to her. The cold case unit continues to work Jennifer's case in hopes of bringing closure to her family, and they're always following up on leads. I'm hoping by providing the known details and facts that maybe someone out there will know something and help solve this very unfortunate crime. So please join me in remembering Jennifer Odom. Jennifer Renee Odom was born on August 25th, 1980 to her mother Renee Converse. Jennifer's father didn't appear to be around much, but she did find a father figure in Clark, her mother's husband. Jennifer had a sister named Jessica who was three years younger than she was. She lived in the rural community of St. Joseph, located in Pasco County, Florida. St. Joseph was known for being mostly farmlands and orange groves, but had a strong sense of community. The family's property sat on 15 acres down a narrow dirt road and was pretty isolated with one of their only neighbors being her grandmother. At the time of her disappearance, Jennifer was attending the seventh grade at Waitman Middle School. She was an excellent student who was consistently on the honor roll, and she had a passion for math and held aspirations of practicing law one day. Jennifer was also an avid clarinet player and water skier. Her athleticism resulted in her placing seventh best in the country for her age in the sport. Her mother recalls how full of life Jennifer was. She was oftentimes the skier who would climb to the top of the human pyramid and glide atop the water. Above all else, Jennifer came from a home of love. Her and Jessica were best friends, and she held a very close bond with her mother, Renee. Renee oftentimes tried to arm and protect her girls from the evils of the world. She gave them tips and tricks on how to be safe due to her and Clark's working schedules. Some of these tips included zigzagging the orange grove since strangers didn't know the area like they did. And if trouble was ever to occur, she wanted them to drop personal items. Renee felt she prepared the girls to spot the dangers of life, but unfortunately, these lessons weren't enough. On February 19, 1993, Jennifer assumed her normal routine of getting ready for school. This particular day was cool, but not cold, so she chose to wear white jeans, a red pullover sweater, a Hooters branded hoodie, and black lace-up boots. Jennifer grabbed her backpack, purse, and clarinet case, then headed out the door with her mother. Renee always drove Jennifer to the bus stop in the morning, since it allowed the pair to share these little moments together. Jennifer's bus stop was located about 200 yards from her home at the intersection of Jessamine and Jim Denny Roads. Her mother recalled on this particular day, they were discussing math and much like any day, the bus arrived and Jennifer climbed aboard. She sat in the back of the bus like she always did and waved goodbye to her mother until their paths diverged. Around 4 p.m. the same day, Jessica arrived home from school. To much of her surprise, she found the family home locked and no signs of anyone inside. Normally, Jennifer arrived home at 3, and Jessica thought she may be playing a prank, so instead she walks over to her grandmother's to get help. Jessica called her mother and let her know that Jennifer wasn't home. This wasn't a common occurrence for Jennifer, so Renee reaches out to Jennifer's friends. She becomes really panicked when she is informed by Jennifer's best friend that Jennifer had gotten off of the bus. Renee immediately contacts authorities and reports Jennifer as missing. Between February 19th and the 25th, police, as well as hundreds of volunteers from the community, were searching for the 12-year-old girl. Nothing halted search efforts, including bad weather. Law enforcement utilized every resource, including canines. They covered a total of 60 plus miles during the search efforts. Details of her clothing and belongings were made public knowledge in hopes that someone, somewhere, saw something. Jennifer's classmates from the bus were also interviewed. 
All present remember Jennifer exiting the bus and waving goodbye, carrying both her backpack and clarinet case. However, another detail emerged. Some of the students remembered seeing a truck. This truck was described as an older faded blue truck. It possessed a silver painted bumper, trailer hitch with hanging wires, and pipes or a ladder in the bed of the truck. The truck was described as accelerating at a crawling speed when the bus drove by. The driver of the truck was described as a white male in his 40s with brown shoulder length hair. No one saw the truck stop or Jennifer even interact with it. Sadly, all of these efforts did not end up paying off. Six days later, around 11 a.m., a man and a woman searching an abandoned orange grove in southeast Hernando County discovered the body of Jennifer Odom. This particular area was about 10 miles from her home. She was left wearing only her jewelry, which consisted of two rings and a gold necklace with two charms. Her clothing and personal items were not found alongside her. Initially, she was only identified by her best friend's forever charm on the necklace, but was later confirmed by fingerprint analysis. The once hundreds of searchers now turned mourners. The community was distraught by this news. The schools offered crisis counseling and the supermarkets donated tissues in an effort to help the students who were not only sobbing, but scared. The medical examiner determined her cause of death was due to blunt force trauma to the head. It was also determined she was assaulted and likely died in the area not long after her abduction. Little evidence was available and investigators began exploring the avenues they knew, specifically the truck. They started pulling over trucks in the area that matched the description. Police believed her murderer was well acquainted with the area due to their ability to quickly grab Jennifer and disappear. They also felt the dumping site was very off the beaten path and not one you would just stumble upon. They also felt that the crime didn't feel random enough, that maybe at some point the abductor had met Jennifer or seen her and then learned of her routines and schedules in order to pull this off. It didn't feel like a crime of opportunity to them. 16 months had passed and no promising leads had turned up. With no other directions to go, investigators decided to do something unconventional. They brought in psychic Nancy Meyer who gained a reputation amongst law enforcement. She consulted on more than 300 investigations by that point. Nancy determined from visiting both the abduction and dumping site that this crime was committed by two men. She stated the men were mechanics, muscular, and worked as a team. One of the men she believed to be a smoker with a bad cough. Apparently, these men grabbed Jennifer after asking her for directions. She didn't think Jennifer was killed where she was found and was able to accurately describe her belongings that had not yet been found. Investigators felt Nancy provided a lot of useful information and was extremely accurate. Regardless of true visions or not, Nancy encouraged them to spread out and check areas they hadn't before. On January 5th, 1995, a couple searching for scrap metal in a rural area of Hernando County stumbled upon Jennifer's backpack and clarinet case. They were discovered in some heavy brush near a dirt road 12 miles west of the area where her body was found and approximately 20 miles from her home. Both items matched the description even down to the initials inside the case. Inside of the book bag, a textbook was also found which had her name written inside. Upon retrieval, police were able to pull fingerprints from both items which didn't match anyone related to the case. But unfortunately, no suspect was identified from this lead. For almost 30 years, Jennifer's family continues to have no answers, but not for a lack of effort. Not only has every lead since 1993 been followed, but a detective has been assigned to actively work her case. The tip line is still active and consistently monitored while the files are also being continually reviewed. Law enforcement has also put Jennifer's story on Unsolved Mysteries, which aired in December of 1994 and America's Most Wanted. They also put up billboards and even included her case on inmate playing cards in hopes of jogging someone's memory. In a way, these efforts have paid off. While no one has been officially convicted, they have gained valuable tips and many persons of interest. 
The persons of interest list has grown quite lengthy, but I did want to share some interesting insights I stumbled upon while looking into this case. The people I'm going to discuss have never been charged, but were questioned in relation to Jennifer's murder. I found these from others who have been conducting extensive research into the case, and I thought it may be interesting to get my audience's take on them. So let's get into it. From the Murder Squad podcast, they mentioned two viable suspects, the first of them being a man named Richard Mark Ivonitz. Richard was actually a convicted serial killer whose MO consisted of kidnapping young girls from their front yards. The first of his victims was Sophia Silva, who was abducted in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. In 1996, her remains were found a month later off of State Road 3. The following year, he kidnaps sisters Kristen and Katie Lesk, both of whom were assaulted and strangled. The girls were later discovered in the South Anna River. Then in 2002, he follows his same pattern, kidnapping 15-year-old Kara Robinson Chamberlain in Columbia, South Carolina. Unlike previous victims, he kept Kara in his apartment where she was repeatedly assaulted. But once he fell asleep, she thankfully escaped and got help from authorities. Richard fled to Sarasota, Florida, but took his life once police began closing in on him. He confessed to some of his crimes to his sister prior. Upon searching the home, evidence was recovered and they were able to link him to three other murders. The second person's mentioned is Frank Potts. Frank was a migrant worker who picked up odd jobs in the orchards and spent most of his time moving town to town to find work along the southeast. In 1982, Frank assaulted an 11-year-old girl and was sentenced to 15 years in prison, which he only served six of. At the age of 50, he was arrested again for battery against a 10-year-old in Lakeland, Florida in 1993, where he was given a life sentence. After the arrest, his property was searched and surprisingly, the remains of Robert Gines, a man who went missing in 1989, were discovered. The Murder Squad podcast has explained that these are two rabbit holes. There is no specific information that ties these men to Jennifer Odom, but due to the MOs and locality and victims and their temperaments, they believe they could have some kind of connection. So if you or anyone you know has any information, you can contact them in their podcast. I'll post the link in the description, or you can just forward it straight to the Hernando Sheriff's Department. The next persons of interest I want to mention are from the blog Florida Justice, which was posted by Jen Moslick. I'm also sorry if I butchered your last name. Jen has done extensive research into Jennifer's case, and her blog really is a great read if you have the time to check it out. I'll also link this in the description. She discusses the possibility of two suspects that I feel maybe fit the bill more than the previous ones mentioned. The first man is Al Kiefer Jr. Kiefer's family were longtime residents of San Antonio, Florida and affluential since his father operated several popular businesses in the downtown area. Specifically, their pharmacy, which opened in 1953, was a very popular spot for the kids since it had a soda fountain and cafe. Al Kiefer Jr., or AJ as she refers to him, ran the family's sporting goods store. AJ was questioned in relation to Jennifer's murder. How he was dropped onto police radar is unclear to me since AJ had no criminal background and was very active in the community even after he was questioned. He did eventually relocate to Alaska, but kept his home in Florida which he still makes frequent trips to. This home mentioned sits near a lake called Lake Jovita. Lake Jovita is a popular spot amongst residents for water activities, especially water skiing. In 2013, authorities got a tip that led to them dragging the lake in hopes of finding the truck involved in the kidnapping, but nothing was found. While searching, a neighbor spoke to reporters confirming that weeks before Jennifer's murder, they saw a young girl taking ski lessons on the lake, but never thought much of it. AJ was not in Florida at the time, but was contacted for a statement confirming his initial questioning in 1993. However, he refused to answer anything without a lawyer present. AJ hasn't been charged or investigated further, but one linking clue that Jen brings up is AJ is also an avid water skier. So is it such a stretch to think that maybe at some point the pair's paths might have crossed? Another interesting character she outlines is Walter Descharmes. For starters, Walter fit the description that was provided of the perpetrator from the children. 
He also lived in Pasco County at the time of Jennifer's abduction and murder. While in Pasco County, he worked as a day laborer, mostly in construction and landscaping. Unlike Kiefer, Walter had an extensive criminal history ranging from DUIs to exposing himself to a minor. A lot of these crimes involve violent actions, mostly from abusing his first and second wife. Walter was questioned twice in relation to Jennifer, once in 1996 and again in 1998, but each time he fled in order to avoid police interrogation. In fact, it seemed any time he was faced with law enforcement, he fled. After receiving an injunction for abusing his second wife, he took off to his home state of Maine. However, just because he fled, his problems were far from over. His second wife, Kim, came forward and told police that Walter was the one who killed Jennifer Odom. This new information was enough to hold him in custody in Maine until Hernando County could come and interview him, but it wasn't enough to extradite him back to Florida. Another two years would pass before investigators decided to question him again, but this time he flees to New Hampshire. After an eight-day manhunt, he is finally found, and investigators feel with Kim's testimony they have enough to put him in front of a grand jury, so he is sent back to Florida. But unfortunately, Kim was not as reliable as they had hoped. During this period, she managed to tell three different versions of the same story, even implicating herself in one of them but quickly changing it back to Walter. And at another point, she said her ex, Earl Boone, was responsible. Earl was looked into at the same length as Walter, since he too was a career criminal and he fit the description, but no connection could be made to Jennifer. Reportedly, the only reason they clung to her stories for as long as they did was due to a detail she provided which wasn't public knowledge. But it wasn't enough and no charges could be filed against Walter. Kim was also a shady character since she too had a criminal past and was incarcerated at the time for child abuse when she confessed that Walter was a murderer. She was in and out of jail for years and ultimately died in prison in 2016. Unfortunately, it seems these two suspects, I guess we can call them, are a dead end since law enforcement couldn't concretely connect them to Jennifer at all. And this is what Jen explains in her blog. I just wanted to kind of give you like a little Cliff Notes version, but she has a lot of information about these two individuals. And if you're interested in doing further reading, I would suggest go looking into it. More recently though, like 2017 recent, DNA linked to another case was brought up in relation to Jennifer's case. This specific case followed a similar MO to Jennifer's, except almost a year earlier. In January 16, 1992 in Pasco County, 17-year-old Carolyn Murray was taken from her bus stop. She was led behind a vacant house where she was bludgeoned in the head and assaulted. Carolyn was found hours later by a family member clinging to life. She was in an area just 15 minutes from where Jennifer was found. Carolyn had to undergo several surgeries due to the extensive damage and part of her brain was removed. DNA was gathered from the scene and they had no suspects at the time. Then around 2012, a man named Jeffrey Norman Crum II is convicted on two counts of armed robbery. During the booking process, his DNA was collected and entered into CODIS, also known as the Combined DNA Index System, and unsuspectingly, they got a hit on this unsolved case from 1992. However, investigators felt Jeffrey Crum, who would have only been 10 or 11 at the time, was too young to have committed this crime. So they opted to gain DNA voluntarily from Crum's family members, and it comes back as a match for his father, Jeffrey Norman Crum Sr. This was the first time familial DNA was used to procure an arrest in Florida. Crum Sr. had been previously charged with assault and kidnapping in 1987 as well. Due to the similarities between the two cases, police are looking into Crum as a viable suspect in the murder of Jennifer Odom. No updates have been provided at this time. If you or someone you know has information regarding the abduction and murder of Jennifer Odom, please contact Detective George Lloydgren at the Hernando County Sheriff's Office. I do want to say I think it's neat when I come across a cold case that is still being worked to this day because I feel a lot of the time departments aren't able to give as much attention and the only ones still fighting for justice are their loved ones. It's very bittersweet and I hope Jennifer's family and even the community get peace. 
30 years of being haunted by tragedy is such a long time. I want to thank you again to the viewer who suggested this case because who knows, maybe someone out there knows something and cold cases matter. Thank you to my viewers who made it this far. You are very much appreciated. And I wanted to go ahead and also shout out again to the Murder Squad podcast and Florida Justice blog because they had some very interesting insights. I couldn't find too much on other suspects, so I was very appreciative when I found their information and what they thought might have, you know, occurred or why they felt that they were suspects or questioned in the first place. So if you have time, go check them out. Like I mentioned before, I will link their stuff in my description. If you found this to be informational, please consider giving the video a thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed yet, you should because we would love to have you under the ash tree. I've been getting this question more, so I thought I would mention it again. If you have a case that you would like me to discuss, please email it to me. My email is listed on the screen and it is also in the description box. This method just makes it easier for me to not only find it, but to also communicate easier in case you have pictures or something you want me to include in the video. But that being said, thank you all for being the nicest to me and always making my week. You're the best and as always, I will see you in the next one. Bye friends.